All right, so we have our poll. Almost everybody's heard of GANs because everybody talks about GANs. Uh, we've got five thumbs up for graphs, but no th thumbs down for graphs, which is good. Majority deep learning knowledge, slight majority uh, no knowledge of PyTorch. Um, I think that should still be fine, especially with the majority deep knowledge, uh, majority knowledge of deep learning. Um, okay. So, should we just get started then if there's no more questions? Um, okay. Um, just to reiterate as well with Amir's uh, point about the capstone, the capstone you can either uh, you can either re-implement everything that has been done in this paper or you can write a critique of this paper in a blog. Um, I would say the, re the implementation is probably a lot more fun for me, but it can also be very difficult. Um, the implementation, I would say, doesn't have to be like one-to-one. -one. Make your own choices as to what is necessary and effective. And yeah, OK. So OK, so Xiang is asking if there's any more questions. So next week, we're going to be doing um, anomaly detection with categorical data. Uh, has Who here has worked on anomaly detection techniques? OK. Um, so I think what's fun about this is that when it's numerical, it's, you know, you can say, well, with this combination of numbers, is this, you know, if you aggregate them in some way, you add them, you multiply them, or whatever, is this an unusual output? But you can't really do that with categorical data when it's like this IP address and this user and this machine. So how do you do that? So that's what we're going to be covering next week. Um, should be fun. And also a little bit more grounded in reality than the adversarial thing. Yeah, so this is more supervised learning, uh, particularly the first half where you're dealing with the unbalanced data. The second half, I mean, it's kind of unsupervised learning, it's kind of supervised learning, it's that it's in that weird in between. Right. Um, Actually, I, I just have like a, like a general question. Yep. Like with, with, with such problems where you have unbalanced data, say, Say, uh, 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 say fraud detection, right? You are at a bank or an insurance yeah. company, and like you, you have fraud data, for example, right? Yeah. You don't have much, 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 much labeled data, right? I mean, or maybe the you have only one percent of your claims or are like fraudulent, right? Would you like, hopefully less? Yes, I was going to say. I was like, that is really high. <laughs> <laughs> like from the get, would would, would you would you would you put your energy focus on supervised or unsupervised? Okay, so the question was. Um, <laughs> In an unbalanced data situation, extremely unbalanced, such as fraud data, where you have less than one percent is fraud, would you focus your energy on supervised or unsupervised? Um, graph gra or graphs? Yeah. Well, I'll I'll answer the supervised learning part, and you can answer the graph part about that um, loudly because you're not on a mic. <laughs> um, okay. So the supervised learning, I would always say supervised learning because. You have labels. It's actually one of those wonderful few instances in crime or cyber crime or anything where you get labels because people ring up the bank and go, what the hell is this? I did not spend $5,000 on an Airbnb in Miami, right? So you get feedback from all sorts of different sources. You get feedback from clients. You get feedback from um, uh, police force, like from uh, uh, law, law enforcement agencies, you get feedback from Visa and MasterCard where you're being told like, okay, you're, we're seeing a lot of fraud here. We believe that this business has been compromised. And then you can investigate, well, who shopped in that business? And maybe are there any anomalous purchases there? And blah, blah, blah. And then you investigate with the clients. Anyway, you end up getting labels. If you have labels, even if it's unbalanced, I, you can still get very good efficacy. Like you can still get very good scores in a 1,000 to 1 ratio. You, you can go down the unsupervised route, um, but I would generally recommend not to. 
but there is also the graphical model route. Yeah, I add. Uh, <clears throat> so I add some. Uh, oh, uh, does this work? Is it hear. plugged in? Yes. Yeah, people can hear me. Okay, okay. yeah, awesome. Uh, I should add something to Cal's answer. Like, remember, like, let's keep in mind in the businesses. We don't want to have perfect model with the high <clears throat> yeah. ratio, finding ratio, or like high F1. We want to reduce the fraud loss. Right? We want to make <coughs> that one percent, which is extremely high, to like 0 0.09 percent, right? and that that changes a little bit our concept of the good model and bad model, yeah. or good model. Like any model that helps to reduce that value is a good model, right? Mm -hmm. Might maybe not the mo not the most optimum one, not the most optimized one, not the highest F one the score we can reach, or uh, <clears throat> uh, or any other indicators you read in the papers, but it's still business agree with it and value that that model because uh, it helps business. You just like add this part as well, like remember, <coughs> like when in the business world when they talk about, hey, we use supervised model, it's necessarily not the best model. So even with imbalanced data, we can reach the good, we can bring some value to the business. Um, yeah. you, so you can even change your loss function here by saying you could yeah. assign a dollar value. Like the dollar value could impact the loss function. Yeah, it could be your alpha here. Right. I mean, right. But when, when when you talk about the business interface, I mean the, the way I see it is. First of all, you need, you need to identify a, a human error, right? For example, if, if I have this problem, like we, so f fraud in banks, right? Yeah. If, if, if this problem is, is up to the humans, maybe maybe they have an, an accuracy of what, 99%. Like if, 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 if they see all the features, they will detect uh, that, 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 that this is a fraud, right? But the idea is when I, when I build a model and I have now 70%, 70 70 uh, uh, say, accuracy, mm -hmm. then I have an, a, an avoidable bias of, like, say, 29%, which is a huge, right? So for, I mean, at least for me, or like, yes, you, you, you define your problem, but at the, at the beginning, you have to have the benchmark. The, the human error is, the, is, the, is this amount, and then the machine is, is good at this amount, and then I, I, do, I do have an avoidable yeah. bias now that maybe... Actually, I don't actually know what the human error is, and if you looked at a transaction and said that's fraudulent or not. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't even know if it would be that great, because often a lot of the times... It's usually call, right? Yeah. Like, right. people call call yeah. centers. Uh, it's it's often very hard to know that fraud has occurred because, you know, we can make all sorts of assumptions about geolocation and uh, like flights and expensive purchases. But if you make too many assumptions, you're literally just going to be pissing off your clients because they're just right. saying like, I wanted to use my card at this very important moment and you didn't let me. So again, there's a business decision where you have to make sure that you're you're enabling the flow of money so that your client is happy, but at the same time you're, you're stifling unusual transactions. But there is no ground truth when it comes to fraud, which is another thing that is weird, mm -hmm. except that it happened or not. But there's no ground truth in the features. Really. Yeah, like how even how it happened, like at least based on our experience, mm -hmm. is not the ground truth. Uh, for graph, I wanted to say I'm going to teach it in uh, Tuesday. The whole idea is like teaching graph, like finding fraudulent activity using graph on the imbalanced data. So this is the whole third section. So I'm really excited for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> can, you, can you take two questions from online? Happily. Uh, oh, you can see it. So, I think you partially answered them both. So, so the question, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, do you want to read no, it? No, please read it. Yeah. Okay. So oh. the question is... Sure, you don't have a mark. Oh, oh, sorry. I will read it then. So the first one, what do you think about possible non-flagged? Right. So what do you think about possible non-flagged examples of fraud? Uh, oh, like, sorry. Yeah, no. Okay. You want? No, please. So you mean, uh, I assume when you say non-flagged example, it means... False negatives. False negatives, right? I would think so. Yeah. So, <clears throat> again, it's a business decision. Like every, there's no perfect system, right? And then business lose money because the false negatives. One thing uh, we can, we personally do, is if we develop any new models, we back test through our previous year, for example. 
and see if there were false uh, negatives that we didn't catch or we could like actually that's how we show value of our models practically we, we say we detect these are the false negatives one as well like these are the false like we detect all the ones that call center catch all the one that previous model previous system catch and we've assumed these are the fraud that nobody catch or nobody look at it but remember again the fraud false negative frauds are usually very small amount like nobody loses uh, like 10 grand or 20 grand and do not call call center hey i false like uh, <clears throat> like i didn't notice that or something like that this is this is <clears throat> And this is very important to remember. People like the call center is very important factor of uh, our uh, label data. It's not like previous models or our fraud detection model. The call center yeah. data is usually false negative in other system, but people call. Uh, if we something miss, if something is missed, usually it's a small amount, right? Like you miss like one cent in your like nobody tracks by one dollar the account or one cent yes let's say one cent or two cent right those are those are missed and missed yeah that's why there are schemes that people are still one cent from thousand of our accounts right so another question was so even if your model will be more biased towards true positives it also will be fine right um yeah i mean depends on what your appetite is as box said all models are wrong some are useful so you'll never get a perfect model They'll always have some bias in them. Um, but uh, yeah, and then their follow up question was how you, uh, how do the banks find that trade off? And as Amir says, usually you would associate dollar value to each, I'm just reading it, literally what you said, to each case. <laughs> and yeah, but you're, you're optimizing for lots of dollars. You're also just looking at like our customers walking out. Um, how many. It how, part of loss of dollar. Right? Yeah, how many uh, call center hours are being occupied? Like. Are people getting are like the workers getting slammed having to pull in like extra shifts just to get through all of this or you know if we lower the uh false positives a little bit then can they actually go home and, and see their children so yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that we have them working for hours and hours and hours i'm trying to say that there's human beings at the end of this that are trying to deal with this so there there's a lot of things you need to balance for you want to keep your clients happy, you want to keep your employees happy, and you want to catch the bad guys. So it's, it's that's real world data science at the end of it, yeah. you know, because you go in really happy to the meeting saying, look, I have this score. And it's like, that's cool. How does that help me? Because like now this means that there's going to be about 60,000 false positives in an, in an hour. It's like, that's awful. <laughs> yeah, they like sometimes the false, like lower false positive rate is even better than like account like dollar saving right because like higher false positive means like people ha like we have to have an employee to go through them manually and that's that's again another type of loss right mm -hmm. so you have to see it as a whole so you're saying for example well, the, I mean, if you have a false negative where you miss that crowd you're gonna lose money but if you if you have a false positive where you have you actually have to put extra resources to actually go thoroughly exactly. through those, exactly. you're also spending more, more money there too, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is where the balance that we want to yeah. focus on recall or precision, yeah. right? Which one which one do you value more? And the same thing can happen in like you're looking at an intrusion detection system. It's like fine, this is great. It it's it false and negative rate is really, really low, but what do I do with all of this information? It's just a deluge of just alerts coming at me and like I'm a human being I can't process these so give me at least the top 10 that you know are really really bad mm -hmm. and maybe we'll let a few slip through the cracks right. I guess false positive also increases the cost associated with that feature because if every time that I want to use my credit card outside of downtown mm -hmm. core it blocks me I'm just immediately going to go to the next bank I want to stay with it. yeah that's it and if you work in a bank and your parents' card gets blocked, you're going to get angry phone calls from them. It's like, I don't even work in your bank. I'm not even in your country. It's like, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Uh, there is an interesting question. I don't know if you guys have insight about it, but can you determine some of these trade-offs with A-B testing? Probably. Yeah. Um, 
It depends. Uh, again, like in fraud is easier than cyber, like in bot detection. Yeah. Again, it's because we have some real false positive. You def- true positive. Yeah, but you definitely could do it with customers because the customers are. I mean, they're pretty like. You can bin customers pretty easily. I mean, you can also bin threat actors, but threat actors evolve, and there's lots of all different things. You can't really do A/B testing so much with yeah. threats because they're also so imbalanced. But if you could do a- A/B testing, say with clients, say pick some random pool of clients that covers the entire gamut of wealth and age and whatever, and do the same, and have one high false positive rate and a low false positive rate, and see what happens. Um, and Maybe they do. I don't know. I doubt they want to play chicken too much with their customer base, though. So. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> I'll answer Ruzbe's question. <clears throat> uh-huh. so, like, <clears throat> so the question is: So the best way to commit fraud then is to take a small amount of money <laughs> for a long period of time. No, that scheme was popular like maybe ten yeah. years ago. Yeah. Now they know how to get that. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, no, that's like one of the main indicators of like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes they just want to test out a card and see if, like does this card work. Yeah. And so when you see these like really weird low. Um, Transactions, I think that's but weird. a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, that's weird as well. And also, like graph, can easily find that. Like it's really easy to see that with graph. Yeah. I know it was joke, but no. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, he's laughing. <laughs> he edited at, at last. <laughs> what is the best way to commit fraud? <laughs> <laughs> that's why people are taking this workshop. <laughs> Yeah. It's fun, funny. No, there you go. Sorry. No, no, no. But if there are no more questions, we can move on to hands-on. Or do you want me to take two minutes break? And then sorry, I just want to say I'm so sorry. Like, there is a um, follow up with Nick's question on on like about the mm. training data is not perfect. Mm. Um, ah. Okay. I would say this is a risk, right? As I said, our model, our results are not perfect. The training data is not perfect. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the data itself is not perfect at all, right? It's um, even looking at merchant data is just a pure and utter nightmare because yeah. chains, like full-on chains, have inconsistencies in how these things are named. Um, the codes that are supposed to say what category they come from they're slowly drifting towards irrelevance because it seems like every hotel gets its own code. And there's a lot of issues with the data. Uh, But yeah, so the data is really messy. You kind of work with it. Yeah, like, as I said, like eventually you have to agree that, have an okay model that works and go forward. Like you cannot have perfect model that will satisfy your needs. your feeling as a data scientist or as a scientist, right? Even if your boss promises their boss that you will have a, a perfect model with zero <laughs> false positives. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Yeah, my boss didn't do that. Because FIA. And I didn't and do that. It's and not I didn't my current do that. boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't do that, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, it's the reality is there's always a trade off between people you hire, between analysts, between the good data, bad data. The hardware you have. The hardware you have, you work with your limitation and try to make most of it. Yeah. So with that, and talking about limitations in hardware, let's do some deep learning with GPUs. Because we don't have limitations in that in our lives, do we? Uh, (laughs) But uh, Google Cloud is actually really fun for this. Um, I don't understand how they give you free GPUs, but it's really great. You should make use of them. They're actually decent GPUs. They're better than the crappy things that I have on my laptop. So, um, OK. So if you want to take a two minute break and um, go stretch your legs, or you start pulling your hair out, uh, or mine, um, yeah, please do. And then we can reconvene. <laughs> <laughs>